Okay, welcome everybody. Um, I hope you all had a chance to talk to the uh, Hawaiian guests scattered throughout uh, the place tonight. Um, if you didn't, and you have, I, I know we have a lot to talk about tonight, um, so if you have any in-depth questions that are, or something that I can't answer on the spot, um, feel free to grab a card at the front. Uh, there's pamphlets as well with information about what we'll be going through tonight. Uh, I'm happy to jump on a call with anybody about AWS and just chat all day. Uh, I have an awesome job that I uh, get paid just to talk to people and not charge those people anything for my time. So uh, it's, uh, I'm, I'm here to evangelize you guys onto AWS. Uh, and hopefully all the topics and new announcements that they've been making uh, at reInvent, which we'll go through tonight, uh, if you're not already converted, maybe this will convert you. Uh, just, just to raise a hand quickly, who's already using AWS? Who's using it in production? Okay, so we've got about half, half unit. Who's, um, who's using a different cloud provider and interested in what's going on in AWS? Who's not willing to admit that? <laughs> okay. Um, so just a quick uh, cap over the agenda for tonight. So we'll do uh, some quick introductions. We'll uh, talk about our sponsors, who obviously we need to uh, uh, recognise them because they've put on such a great feed tonight and uh, made all this possible, uh, all the equipment that you see and everything that's uh, provided is due to their uh, sponsorship. So uh, so we need to make sure that we're uh, buying their products. <laughs> uh, so, and uh, then, then we'll just do a cloud recap. So I know the focus tonight is AWS, but the whole idea of uh, doing the pub group is around uh, just having a look at what else is happening in the other clouds out there as well. Obviously, it's not an in-depth look. We'd be here all night just having a look at everything that's announced each month. Uh, but just a quick cloud recap there, and then we'll get into the meat of the night. So we'll start talking about um, what, all the announcements that happened at reInvent. Uh, there's some that I will uh, concentrate on, others that I'll skim over due to other events in the local area that have already uh, touched on those topics. But feel free at any time to raise your hand, I'll try my best to answer any questions. Obviously these things are new, so we're all learning together. Uh, but uh, I'd be interested in Anybody as well, uh, if you want to let us know of uh, your experiences, if you've already been playing around with some of the preview or beta uh, pieces in AWS. And then just finally, lightning talks. Uh, great opportunity there, like I was saying, to tell us about your experiences with this new stuff, but also if you've got something that you've been doing in AWS, you want to grab the floor, three to five minutes, and tell us about your new SaaS application that makes life easier in AWS or uh, that automatically parks your Tesla car, then uh, let us know. <laughs> so, quick introduction to Pug. Um, we are amalgamated with some other uh, user groups as well, um, depending on the topics for the night. Uh, so, but for Pug alone, public cloud user group, uh, we're up to 240 members, so that's uh, over the last 12 months we've had 15 events, uh, pretty much at least one per month, and uh, so we're growing pretty quick. Uh, we are looking for speakers around big data and analytics. I think it's February or March next year we've, uh, we're doing it on that topic, uh, so very interested in anybody who's actually using uh, those pieces. It can be AWS or any other cloud um, out there. Uh, we, be really interested in hearing from you about what you're doing out there with that. Volunteers, if anybody's interested in getting involved, uh, we're always looking for volunteers to make this happen. Uh, and then just the whole point of this is uh, to be a community focused thing. So although we have sponsors making this happen, uh, we want to keep agnostic and not be slanted towards any sort of uh, bias towards any cloud platform or solution or anything like that. Uh, so nothing's taboo on topic, uh, very interested in hearing the comparisons between everything. Um, and so, because the idea is this is just to educate and share and learn. So obviously, there's, I don't know everything and I would love for other speakers to come up here and help me out with uh, the areas in knowledge that I'm a gap. 
Uh, so no agenda except for uh, obviously we want to keep it cloud focused. Then just finally, um, the website coffeecloud.net is where we put up the uh, the videos. And if you miss the headlines or you just want to save your uh, film on your camera for taking photos, so you can actually just go to the website and uh, view all the headlines that we go through uh, in this on that site. Um, also, if you're running a user group that's related to cloud or you know of anybody, uh, we're happy to use our sponsorship dollars to help you guys out, put on those events, record them, uh, put these cameras up and record that, professionally put them together and put them up online for you as well. So feel free to take advantage of that, reach out to me. And just finally, um, this lonely little PC in the corner here is actually quite the powerhouse, touch screen, uh, wireless keyboard, uh, running uh, the latest version of uh, Windows Hyper-V server with uh, Red Hat, latest version of Red Hat as a VM and the latest version of Windows, I think Windows 10 is on it. And the idea of that is to let you guys, when you come here, just jump over there, try out some things, um, have myself or others there that can help you out to uh, chart the uncharted territories and introduce you to anything. Or if you have a question that we need to jump in there uh, during the little 30 minutes at the start uh, and try something out, you've been dying to get somebody in front of your problem, uh, that's what that PC over there is for. So in future events, feel free to jump over there and uh, jump in. Obviously, keeping with the dog theme, we've uh, come up with a pretty lame name. <laughs> So, uh, quickly just expanding on the introductions, just to let you guys know some activity that is happening. Uh, you may have noticed the cards there and on the uh, flyer, uh, the Kiss My AWS. Um, this is something that we created uh, for the AWS leaders worldwide at reInvent. Uh, so we got so much attention about that, we're actually rebranding it to awsusergroups.com. And the idea there is uh, the leaders worldwide, especially in Europe and here in uh, other areas outside of uh, the US, don't get much help from AWS to help coordinate a lot of the groups. Uh, so we're putting together there to uh, amalgamate all our efforts into one pool, but also the next evolution of that will be to uh, help you guys out with education and other things there. Uh, so yes, it is a leader's resource for the events, but also we're going to be looking at uh, community mentorship, help you guys out with AWS exams. I think somebody mentioned, I had somebody mention about uh, getting the associate exam level. Uh, so happy to help you guys out and put those resources all together in there. AWS do a great job of that, uh, but we want to take that a step further. So just quickly, the sponsors, Nutanix is a major sponsor. Uh, to help this event, they have a plugin straight into AWS, uh, so you can have your on-premise or traditional data center with their Lego block philosophy of putting together your uh, hardware, uh, but still hook that into AWS. Trend Micro have got their intrusion detection and prevention uh, in the marketplace on AWS, and being just uh, Aaron was telling me earlier about all this great stuff that's happening on AWS. Uh, from Beam, and uh, it's hard to keep up with uh, what they're doing around backup and uh, disaster recovery. And uh, also, uh, next month we'll actually have them up here talking about uh, what they can do for test dev. Uh, and then just quickly, Coffee Cloud, which uh, we were talking about earlier, uh, where all the videos and blogs are uh, related to this event. So just briefly, I'll just hand it over to our major sponsor, Softress, to <laughs> have a chat about what we've been doing. Um, and again, uh, everybody with a Hawaiian theme tonight is here from Softress, so uh, but I'll let Matt here tell you about. Do we have any other slides or just that one? Just that one. Okay. So I know you guys don't want to listen to me and you want to learn more about AWS, and I can make a lot of fun, but it's not going to help you much with what you're going through. Um, how many people here have been to multiple hug events, more than one so far this year? Okay, so a number, of, a number of new people. So thanks for coming out. We hope we make this as uh, useful as possible. Obviously, we're really lucky to work with uh, Matt Carolyn here, who will be presenting to you guys um, on behalf of uh, behalf of us as a, as a fantastic cloud 
evangelist, and I, I take him up on his offer for free consulting. I don't know how you get a job where you get to have fun traveling across North America and, uh, and do free consulting and somehow get a paycheck for it, but you know he's got a he's got a great gig. He's really smart and he helps out you know numerous customers right across North America. So Soft Choice has offices from Vancouver to Halifax, Seattle to Florida. In Canada, currently, we are the only authorized managed service provider with Amazon. So we are able to help if you have challenges around billing, reporting, all sorts of things. We've got numerous different services that can help you know, make AWS even a, a little easier than I'm, I'm sure you all find it already is. Um, on that, you know, we got numerous awards. You guys really don't, uh, don't need to hear about any of that right now. We'll turn it over to Matt so we can get into some of the fun stuff. Um, and I do want to thank, there are some members of AWS that we didn't know were, were showing up today that have snuck into the, uh, into the audience as well to, to see what's going on. So, you know, great to see everybody out here today. And uh, hopefully we can help. Thanks, Matt. Yeah, it gets a bit confusing with the film. Like being called Matt. <laughs> <laughs> Matt and Matt show. <laughs> yeah, I, often in the office I'll hear somebody going, oh, Matt really annoys me half the time. And I'm like, why did I do this? <laughs> <laughs> so, and just finally, um, this venue, uh, obviously, uh, we couldn't have this in this larger crowd uh, without CodeCore. Uh, donating the space to us. So, uh, for those that are interested in uh, education around coding, uh, let me know and I'll put you in touch with the right people. Uh, but, but yeah, this is a great venue that they've let us have and interrupt and annoy their students while I uh, blast away on this megaphone. So, just to recap on what's been happening with the cloud. Uh, so. VMware's vCloud Air. Uh, it, it, if you've been living under a rock, you may not have heard about this in the technology space, but Dell actually bought EMC. Um, silly me, didn't realize at the time that that is such a big deal with, uh, I think anyway, the VMware bit is the bigger piece that got me interested. Um, that, that changes a lot. Dell already have uh, a tool out there that does integrate with it a lot of different clouds out there, uh, and this will actually, I don't know whether it will change that to be biased towards VMware, but obviously most data centers anyway already use VMware, so uh, that's a big move there from them. Uh, Google uh, has teamed up there with uh, to improve their uh, CDN network. Uh, obviously, uh, I must say Cloudflare is one of the ones, and uh, the name escapes me, uh, but there's always three that I always hear about: Amazon, Cloudflare, and, and uh, anyway. Uh, so it's interesting to see the Cloudflare is in there with uh, level three, which many of you know. Uh, the other two in the middle, I haven't really heard of much before, uh, but some people probably scoff at me for not knowing them. Uh, but this goes to show that Google is doing the. Uh, uh, teaming up approach, which is interesting also because they teamed up with VMware uh, to do their storage piece uh, just uh, earlier this year. Um, Microsoft Azure had a few announcements. Obviously, Amazon had a lot more, but obviously we're going to go through them tonight. Uh, but uh, Microsoft Azure has got a uh, resource health check. So a bit like um, CloudWatch with AWS in that uh, it's going to do the health monitoring, but it's also going to have uh, actionable guidelines that will guide us uh, to help you remediate the issues that it identifies. Uh, then they have their uh, new uh, data lake analytics and data lake store uh, in preview that's been launched, and uh, three new regions in India, which I will claim to saying last year I thought AWS was going to announce India. Uh, so I'm very surprised that uh, Amazon's getting ahead of them there because I think there's a lot of opportunity there if they can keep the power on. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, something just a little bit left of field I thought was interesting though is to uh, let you guys know there's a new cloud phone from a new startup company called Nextbits. Uh, 
I'm not totally sure if it's really a cloud phone when uh, it uses your local storage first and only when it starts running out of storage does it start offloading to the cloud. Uh, but then again, nobody's really used it yet, so the details aren't there. But it's interesting to see. I think it's a bit like uh, the philosophy with Google's Chromebook, where uh, we're trying to do everything in the cloud. And, and uh, hopefully that day will come soon, where uh, Rogers, Bell, and Telus and others are going to give us a portable pricing plan so that we can be connected all the time. Uh, and then just finally, Amazon AWS reInvent, which we'll be going through tonight. So, um, I don't know why I put an introduction to myself, but uh, just around soft choice, I guess. Matt was mentioning that we're, I believe we're still the only certified managed service partner of AWS, and uh, took a nice little photo there at the uh, re-event uh, of one of the slides that came up there. So this is worldwide, every single managed service partner uh, that's been certified. So I've been doing this since uh, 2010 on AWS, so that's why people must uh, trust me with this stuff. So, Internet as a Service. Uh, so this is a great bit there. I believe, actually, I, I didn't put this in, but I think it's still in preview or coming soon. Um, but the idea of the Internet as a Service is uh, it's going to be a hub where uh, obviously, a lot of uh, monitoring devices and things are probably going to be out there if you're into this field. Uh, and so, in the past, it's been quite painful. Yes, you can do load balancing and auto scaling and things like that. But to have it as a service really means that uh, you no longer have to really worry about that back end anymore. You can just worry about the devices, the front end, the data collection, the analytics, and just let that auto scale there and look after the back end for you. So, that's exciting. Um, and I'm really, I haven't seen what it looks like yet, but I think that's uh, going to make the Internet of Things like really accessible and easier to adopt. Analytics. So one thing I did notice at reInvent was a lot of the announcements that they made were around services that already existed. Uh, but uh, a lot more integration between the services. So you'll notice a lot of the things here. It's talking about... Um, a new service, but the fact that it integrates with other services that they have, whether they be databases or storage or compute. So QuickSight is uh, around business intelligence, so uh, being able to, uh, again, as a service, uh, be able to generate that sort of information very quickly. Uh, still in preview mode, but, uh, and by the way, uh, just explain what preview mode means. Uh, it means that uh, you have to actually uh, be able to access it by invite. Uh, you can actually jump on the website tonight. Anything here that you see in pre that has preview in brackets next to it means that you'll need to go to the website. There'll be a uh, request uh, button that will let you have your put your e email address and account details. And then if you get approved, they'll uh, let you uh, jump in there and start <coughs> using it in preview mode. Uh, it's one of those things where it's probably ready for production, but may have some little bugs. So they're not going to 100% stand behind it uh, until it goes GA, which is general available for everybody. Uh, so Kinesis Firehose. Uh, so the idea of this is it's going to be, if you want to do streaming and you really uh, want to have something that's cookie cut and easy to get out there onto Amazon, uh, this is the best service for it. So leveraging things like S3 for storage and Redshift, uh, you can just, uh, again, it's more like that service sort of thing where everything's taken care for you and uh, you're just worried about the actual content and the end user experience. Uh, Elasticsearch service. So this is actually, if you haven't heard of it before, it's actually an open source technology. Uh, Amazon are now doing it as a service and it's using the same APIs. So if you're already using uh, Elasticsearch today, or looking at using it, uh, you won't have to relearn anything, you won't have to change your code or anything. The same API applies, Amazon have done uh, transition there to make sure that uh, if you are moving over from uh, on-premise or somewhere else using that technology, then uh, you shouldn't have to uh, reinvent the wheel to be able to jump on board with that. Uh, Kinesis Analytics, so this is coming soon. I, 
I'm not quite sure what coming soon means yet. I was talking to somebody earlier tonight about uh, there's also another development that I've noticed is the word beta uh, is being used now. So uh, previously the word preview would happen and then it would go general available for everybody. Uh, now there's beta and there's coming soon. So I'm guessing the, the roadmap is anything that's coming soon is probably a year out. Uh, anything that's beta is probably 10 months out. Anything that's preview is 6 months out. Uh, and then we, get, we all get to enjoy it. Uh, but don't quote me on that, obviously, different services, different complications, and uh, I've just made that up from my uh, experience of uh, what I've seen. They've had beta before. Oh, they have. When Simple launched in 2008 as a beta, when EBS launched out as a beta, it was still Well, you're, you're, you're an old time of dinosaur compared to me. I only got into it in 2010, so. So uh, I wish I'd been there in 2000, what was it, 2005, 2006 when they first started with S3? Because is just limited GA for big, big companies only. Yes and no. I mean, um, what I found in the past is uh, as soon as these get announced, uh, like at least last year anyway, when they didn't have so many preview announcements, I would jump on the site, put down my details, and it was only a demo account that I was spending probably hundred dollars a month on, and I would get access to the preview stuff. Um, but definitely, we've got clients now, like a large scale, that haven't had to do that. We just tap on AWS's shoulders and say, "Look how much the potential spend is here," and obviously they leapfrog from the head of everybody else. So uh, it does help to be uh, to to have a potential big workload for AWS. They're going to give you more attention, obviously. Um, then we got, uh, so, so Kinesis Analytics anyway, uh, so the idea there is to uh, use Kinesis with SQL queries. Uh, and then Kinesis Streams, this is, um, this is the new title for Kinesis. I don't know why they didn't call it Kinesis Streams Analytics, uh, but my understanding anyway is that whenever you hear somebody refer to Kinesis now, it'll be Kinesis Streams. Uh, feel free to correct me if anybody knows differently. Uh, but so now uh, that's been extended. Previously, you could only store uh, data up there for 24 hours. Now that's been extended to seven days. Uh, I don't know what the default is. I'm guessing still the default might be 24 hours and you have to actually go in there. But uh, there are options there to fine tune that uh, 24 hours to seven days. And obviously, the reason why I'm guessing that it's 24 hours is because seven days will cost you more. So I would assume that Amazon would put you on the cheaper tier by default and then let you scale it up. Is there any questions about the analytics or uh, anybody that's already started using uh, this, this stuff? Yeah, I'm just not really understanding what the idea is behind just being able to upload data for just 24 hours or seven days. What's the, what's the point of doing that, or what's the purpose behind it? Yeah, sure. So the question is, uh, why would you want to put your data up there for 24 hours? So I guess um, Amazon are always using uh, Major League Baseball as a great example. Uh, I don't know if they're using Kinesis or anything like that, but a lot of the stuff that they're doing is uh, real-time data analytics that they're processing and wanting immediately while the... Uh, while the game is being played. Uh, so the idea there is that it's going to pump the numbers in there, crunch it, pop out a result, and then you're going to use that static result uh, loaded somewhere else. Uh, this is more like a temporary buffer memory where you're going to store uh, the number crunching and things like that, pump it out, and then uh, hopefully, uh, I guess their original theory was you wouldn't need longer than 24 hours, but I guess there's some cases where you might want to tap on that more times or evolve, like take it the next step further uh, later on or something like that. So that's uh, that's why they've uh, evolved that and that's why it would be only for temporary pieces. The databases. Uh, so a few um, exciting announcements here. Uh, a lot of my work is around databases. so. 
Uh, anytime I uh, hear anything about this topic, new announcements, I get weak in the knees. Uh, so the migration service is quite interesting. So um, this is a, basically, if you have a database that you have on-premise in a data center or some other cloud, and you want to migrate it over to Amazon, now if it's like for like, you're probably going to find that it gets in there and everything's fine. So Oracle to Oracle, um, MySQL or Microsoft SQL, uh, those sort of services are going to jump over there. But if you have a mixed match, say you've got Microsoft uh, SQL and you're wanting to convert it to MySQL, for instance, this also allows you to do that. Now, if you have something a bit more far-fetched, such as uh, Oracle to MySQL, uh, the, there may be still about 30% of the work left to do, but it's going to identify those issues, so it's going to point out in the code which pieces that you need to fix. Uh, but I think that's a great bit, like the, the um, replication, like the uh, migration for Oracle to Oracle or, or same database to same database, uh, they actually say that they'll actually keep you up to up 100%. Uh, so there's a bit of uh, flicking between services there. The, obviously the uh, migration service where you've got a mixed match of uh, database types, there's obviously going to be downtime there where uh, the potential of, uh, well, it's pretty much uh, a guarantee that it's not going to be 100% uh, converted correctly. Uh, but they're going to do a lot of that work, about 70% of the work uh, to 90% was what they were saying at reInvent. Uh, so, and just leave you with some pieces that they've identified which they can't obviously find a uh, good match or maybe the match has different choices where if they were to assume the choice for you then it could create problems for you. So they're just going to highlight that for you and then you can jump in there and fix that up. So obviously that, those sort of, that, and that was another thing I noticed throughout a lot of these announcements was uh, Amazon and making are really concentrating on making it easier for us to move from uh, from place to place. So obviously the joke is that they're not going to help you to move out, uh, but if we're thinking about on-premise or traditional data centers or another cloud provider and moving into Amazon, they're actually doing a lot of these services to help us make that migration easier. Uh, RDS for MariaDB. I thought there was going to be an applause. <laughs> So we've got our Amazon guys at the front, we've got uh, apparently the one person that uh, made it happen. I don't know why they didn't get you up there on stage in front of everybody and uh, <laughs> throw flowers. Uh, I think it was the front at that time, it was the biggest. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. You guys can get party while we have to learn. Um, so yeah, so those who aren't familiar with RDS, RDS is uh, I like to refer to it as platform as a service, but it's, uh, or others refer to it as database as a service. Uh, so there's uh, Postgres, Microsoft SQL, MySQL, Oracle, and now MariaDB. I don't think I left out one. No, no. Um, and the idea there is you don't have to run a whole virtual machine. So um, there's no overhead of Linux or Windows sitting there. You just got the database, and that's all you have to worry about. Uh, and then you can uh, get into the settings there and have your backup managed for you as well and your auto scaling and your um, uh, load balancing all looked after for you. Uh, so those, those things are all taken care of whereas traditionally if you're running a database on a uh, virtual machine, uh, those sort of things you would have to actually manage yourself uh, and get in there and worry about any uh, uh, issues with this space and others. Uh, so that's a great addition. Uh, can't wait to see. I've actually forgotten that um, there could be more databases. I, I'm now going to, when I get a free moment, I'm going to look over the databases for my wish list and uh, start making some bets on which ones that they bring into RDS next. Actually, I should, uh, I should try to pressure you guys into giving me some hints. Uh, and then Aurora is now available in Tokyo. Uh, so, uh, Aurora is something that I was really excited about 12 months ago when Amazon announced. Um, 
Another big thing that came out of this was Aurora actually went generally available just before reInvent. Uh, so those who aren't familiar with Aurora, the idea is that it should be, I think, I believe it's 10 times faster and uh, more cost effective um, than uh, MySQL database. And the process to convert from MySQL to Aurora is very simple. I tried it out uh, a couple of, when it first went live a couple of months ago. And uh, the only surprise I had was that there was a bit of a limited choice in Aurora sizes. I think there's three or four that you can choose from. Uh, so it does actually add to the fact that you have to get to a certain level of usage with MySQL before you can justify the extra expense. Uh, but even the performance alone may be something that, uh, that convinces you to uh, actually spend that extra. So, and the conversion, I believe, correct me guys if I'm wrong, but I believe there's 100% uptime when you actually do the conversion. So, I actually had a look at the process in the background. I believe it takes a snapshot of your database. Like, it does all this automatically for you. So, it takes a snapshot, then it converts it, then it brings it up, then, it, uh, then the idea is that it's up. And, and there's, uh, there's two methods, I believe. There's one where you're looking at transaction logs and you have to replay those back into it. Uh, and, and that's the 100% uptime, and then there's another one where you can actually bring it down, do the conversion, bring it back up again, and then you don't have to worry about any uh, transaction logs or anything uh, to catch up for the time where it was offline during the uh, conversion. So a lot of people got excited about this one. Uh, and I must say, I'm a bit excited about this as well. It's uh, also going to uh, mute a lot of the uh, uh, roadblocks I've seen in the past, the clients saying to us, I've got petabytes of information, the cloud can't handle petabytes, let alone me get it into the cloud in the first place. Um, so valid point, uh, if you've got petabytes or they were talking about uh, even larger than that during reInvent, uh, it's a valid point if you don't have the bandwidth there to get it up there in the first place and you're not actually growing that petabytes in the cloud already. Uh, but with this, this, this actual box, I took the photo at reInvent. The idea, I think it's a 50 terabyte box. It is? Yeah. Um, so that's 50 terabytes, that box there. The idea is that you plug it in, you, uh, you transfer all your data onto there. Then this little thing here is a little Kindle device, a little uh, e-ink reader. So once you lock it all up, it automatically puts the barcode and everything ready for the courier. You just uh, call the courier, he picks it up and they uh, lug it off. But even though it's only 50 terabytes, you can actually do a lot more of these. Um, and I think there's a two week turnaround on it, uh, up to two weeks for them to, uh, for them to send this out to you, you put the data on, get it back to them and get it into the uh, Amazon cloud. So a lot easier, if anybody's ever done the import-export, uh, this, this is, uh, I'm hoping, will make life a lot easier because in the past, especially if you're, uh, well I don't know yet if this will help out with the virtual machines, but uh, with virtual machines it was very painful and you never knew if you put it onto the disk correctly because obviously Amazon have probably thousands, millions of these coming to them uh, all the time, so they just plug it in if you haven't put everything in the right place, then it fails and uh, they just probably send, send you an email saying, job done, and you look on your Amazon account and you go, well, there's nothing there. So this, this is a great, uh, great little tool uh, that's going to save a lot of time uh, and also uh, remove that uh, problems that people have had with uh, petabyte scale. Wait, does anybody have a watch? I just forgot to have a timer. Okay, we're good. Um, just making sure. Um, so, WAF. This is, um, I've had a lot of people mention to me that they think that this is a game changer. So, what WAF is, uh, obviously it says there, Web Application Firewall. The idea of this is, um, Hopefully nobody gets lazy with their code now and uh, doesn't worry about uh, brute force attacks and SQL injections. But the idea is for it to be uh, dynamically looking at those sort of things and working out sort of like your own. Uh, uh, I, well, I'm going to 
so firewall, but antivirus almost, or prevention uh, detection system that sit there. But you can also add and set your own rules as well. So it's not a, it's not, not only is it a nice cookie cut solution you can put in front of your web workloads uh, that are going out to the public, but you can also fine tune it to your set rules as well. Uh, and then Inspector. Uh, so this is, uh, again, something that will help uh, peace of mind uh, when people have uh, security audits and compliance uh, in the cloud. Uh, but also, if you're making a shift to the cloud, I think this will be very useful to make sure that one thing I do see all the time is people forget about security in the cloud. They uh, seem to have this thought that Amazon's going to look after it all for them. And for some reason, we have a brain explosion and... Uh, start treating our environment in the cloud different from what we work on premise. Uh, so this, this is a good little way, I think, uh, to do a quick sweep over your environment. Yep. Yeah, it's a good question, like, uh, how, how do we know that this is going to, well, I guess, to what level is a security audit going to be? Um, I haven't had an in-depth look at it at the moment. It's in preview, I don't have access to it. But I, knowing Amazon, they're going to have it well documented. Uh, you're going to be able to know everything that they're testing for. Uh, but I, I, think it, I think it's a good start. I think it's something that, um, obviously, Amazon, uh, along with other major cloud providers are all meeting so many different uh, uh, compliances out there. Uh, not just one, but many, and that's layered on top. Uh, so I'm sure they're already aware of all the major compliances out there and are trying to make sure that this meets those sort of standards and makes it easier for when you have one of those audits happening, that at least the security aspect is able to be met and uh, you can produce a report very quickly to those uh, people. Uh, so EC2 dedicated hosts. Uh, I, I'm, I'm excited about this. There's a lot of implications here with dedicated hosts. Um, it is coming soon. Uh, so hopefully that doesn't mean it's too far away. Uh, but I'll skip over workspaces for a a second, but uh, compliance again stems on from the security audit. A uh, lot, lot of discussions, a lot of my talks with clients are normally around security, compliance, and bandwidth. Uh, compliance. A lot of people, a lot of people, especially government entities, have compliance needs where they need to make sure that nobody else is sharing that hardware. And it's one of the big myths about cloud out there is the fact that you are. Uh, somebody else could hack into your hard drive because they're using the same disk or something. Amazon has already got uh, dedicated VMs, but this takes it to that next level uh, where you're getting dedicated hosts. So you're getting a dedicated hardware um, so that you can meet those stricter compliance levels. Uh, also, it helps out with licensing. Some licensing models are still old school method where they believe that you own the hardware and therefore the licensing is around uh, what is in there. Uh, Microsoft M MSDN licensing, for example, is one where you have to actually own the hardware technically uh, to be running it. Uh, and they also have a rule where uh, that hardware can't change within 90 days. So if you're running a virtual machine on Amazon, running the MSDN Microsoft licensing there, and you restart that server, that's that hardware might not be the same hardware when that VM starts back up again. Therefore, you're voiding your licensing. So this helps out there with that. And then finally, just going back up to the top of workspaces. Um, I think this is going to be uh, great for workspaces. There are some things that they've hinted around uh, being able to actually uh, have dedicated hosts and, uh, and this may come about. Uh, a lot of things that have been announced and already in the works are, that are on the wish list for workspaces seem like they may actually come true now, uh, such as, uh, I'm just making sure I don't breach NDA, but, uh, but yeah, there's exciting stuff there anyway around workspaces. I think that's as much as I can uh, I get excited sometimes. Um, 
But in saying that, workspaces itself, if nobody knows, it's uh, Amazon's BDI as a service. Uh, so as little as $25 a month per user, you can have a BDI workspace. And I must say, when they, when they released it last year, and I was using a preview of that, I was very disappointed in it. But it's amazing how much it's evolved in the last 12 months. The fact that you can now uh, uh, cookie cut the golden image application deployments to the workspaces and manage the environments in hundreds of users very easily. Uh, so, so that's great. I think they are still missing the ball on uh, uh, shared file access. Uh, Amazon still has the theory that everybody wants their own my documents style uh, folder. Uh, I do think that that is going to change in the future. Hopefully, where we can all we're all I mean in enterprise anyway. We, we're all used to the, having that Mac drive that everybody accesses. Uh, so something similar along those lines, instead of having our own siloed off storage, uh, is I think the only missing key from workspaces at the moment. Uh, but in saying that, we've done a lot of solutions for clients that have worked around that and got them their Mac drive or their uh, central uh, data storage repository. Uh, ECT, EC2 container registry. So again, something that's coming soon, but this is the next evolution to, for those that aren't aware, um, Amazon have already got their EC2 uh, container service. This has registry and support for Docker. Uh, the support for Docker, I believe, was already there, uh, but this is actually adding uh, on top of that. Uh, EC2 X1 instances, for anybody here who spends a lot of money on large instances, I guess this is your new Ferrari that you've been waiting for to upgrade to. Uh, EC2 container services, oh, again, yep, more uh, support for Docker. And then uh, Limba, okay, so this, this was another one that I got excited about. Uh, so for those that don't know, Lim, Limbada is a uh, service that, uh, before it was around, everybody was uh, creating Linux boxes to do cron jobs. And uh, to just sit there and, uh, and all it did all day was uh, manage and do uh, uh, auto schedule Cron jobs there. So, Lambda was good, uh, but this was the bit I got really excited about. It was funny. Five seconds before they announced it, I was saying to my colleague next to me, I was saying, you know what would be really good though, scheduling. And uh, that's exactly what they got now. Um, there's uh, Python as well, which got big applause in the, uh, in the room when they announced that, and uh, versioning. So, but the scheduling bit, I felt like that was still the big bits why I wasn't using Lambda myself and still using the old school way of doing things. And obviously now, uh, that's, that's going to change. It's Lambda. I knew I was going to answer that. <laughs> that's why I was kind of there, like, I like the Hawaiian version. It's Lambda? Is that how it's called? Lambda. 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 Or is that math? Like math. So just quickly around mobile services, so um, uh, we were chatting about this earlier, uh, so this might be something of interest to anybody who's an iOS developer, Android developer, or, or let's we say Blackberry or Windows. Uh, so this is in beta, uh, but my understanding is that it's going to be very similar to Microsoft Azure's uh, uh, mobile web service that they have, where the idea is that you do your one code, throw it in, and uh, it'll be able to manage everything for you, uh, both on iOS and Android. Uh, I don't know about BlackBerry and Windows and that, I haven't looked into it enough, uh, but obviously uh, iOS and Android are going to be looked after out of the gate. Um, and then API, it, it was funny how uh, there was a lot of announcements about Tokyo. Uh, as I found out at the uh, leaders user group meeting in reInvent, uh, the user groups in Tokyo are pretty amazing. Uh, they have their own mini reInvent over there, organized by the community with thousands turning up. 
Uh, so I, I'm actually interested now to fly over to Tokyo just to go to one of their user groups and see what's happening. Uh, problem being, I, I wish I hadn't learned Japanese in school. Uh, <laughs> You, you'll come over, you'll be my translator? No, why not? Uh, I just, I'll just find somebody to pay for our flight. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I think we're coming to the end now. Uh, config rules is in preview. Uh, the idea of this, it is very limited this at the moment, but the idea is that you can set rules in place to make sure that everybody who's using AWS within your environment, so other people that haven't listened to uh, or or actually don't care about compliance and it's a pain. And you always find whenever you do an order, people are in the last 12 months have circumvented the rules and are cheating. Uh, so you can put rules in place to make sure that they can't do those sort of things. And at the moment, there is uh, a small list of things that you can actually set, uh, but they are gonna grow that. They are looking for feedback around things that they should be adding to this list of clients and uh, it's really about restricting what people can do to make sure that you don't go outside of those compliance rules. And also on top of that you've got the audit trail. So you can actually look back and see, so it's not going to, I believe it's not going to actually stop people from doing something, but it'll trigger an alert to let you know that it's now out of compliance and let you know who did it, when they did it, what they did to actually bring it out of compliance. Um, then CloudWatch dashboards. So this is, uh, you can uh, reuse uh, uh, different graphs around CloudWatch. For those that don't know, CloudWatch is around the monitoring bit of Amazon. So, it was the last slide. Okay, great. I would like to quickly introduce the AWS fellas. Um, already forgot your name. Shandor? Shandor, okay. I can't say Lambada. <laughs> uh, but I'd like to introduce him up to the Amazon team, uh, just to add a little bit extra uh, that I probably missed out. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Uh, I only heard about this event last week, so I didn't prepare to give a talk. Um, my name is Shandor Maurice. I'm a software development manager with Amazon Web Services. Uh, I am part of the team that launched Amazon Aurora. Uh, we went general available. Uh, back in July, and since then we've set the record for fastest growing service in AWS history. <laughs> so I am here with two of the developers that helped bring you Aurora, Alexi sitting right there and behind him, Jackie. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm really glad to be here tonight because I love the opportunity to talk to AWS customers, whether current or prospective. So uh, either after I give a little talk or later in the evening, you're all welcome to come and talk to anyone of the three of us to learn more about what we do at Amazon Web Services. And the three of us, we're all based here in Vancouver. Um, Amazon Aurora, I, it, it's hard for me to not give a, sound like I'm giving a sales pitch when I talk about it, but it's something that I'm really, really excited and passionate about. Um, I'm going to talk about it very quickly and tell you uh, five things that really set it apart. Um, the first one is scalability. So one of the problems with relational databases is when you create one, you have to say, this is the amount of storage space I'm going to allocate. And if you want to allocate more storage space when you run out, you have to basically take down the database. Well, with Aurora, you don't have to say, here's the amount of storage space I want. We automatically provision 10 gigabytes, and as you start approaching your storage capacity, we automatically add more for you behind the scenes, all the way up to 64 terabytes, with no downtime, no performance degradation. You don't even have to know that we're adding more space. So that's, uh, that's the scalability story. The other side of the scalability story is you create an Aurora database with a writer, and then you can create up to 15 reader nodes. Um, these reader nodes can be anywhere up to uh, R3.8x largest, which basically give you, gives you several terabytes worth of memory in total. So you can wind up using it just like a, a, a NoSQL database, where basically all of your data is stored in memory. Um, so that's it on the scalability front. On the, um, on the uh, durability front, all of your data is stored in 10, 10 gigabyte chunks and replicated across uh, at least six storage servers. Uh, behind the scenes. You don't have to know about this, but it's also continuously backed up behind the scenes, so basically your data can never ever get lost. Uh, usually by, by the time I get to this point in the conversation, people start saying, wow, this thing must be terrible performance. You're storing my data six ways? Well, no. We used a bunch of query optimization and uh, cloud computing tricks to make it five times faster than MySQL. 
Finally, by the time we get to this point in the conversation, people are saying, wow, this must be really expensive. Well, it's 10 times cheaper than any commercial database on the market, and there's no licensing involved. You pay for it by the hour, and that's it. So those are just some of the things that I think really set Aurora apart. Um, I grabbed a bunch of $50 Amazon Aurora credits. If anybody wants to take it for a test drive, come talk to me or Lexi or Jack Deep about that. Uh, and if you want to talk to us, uh, any questions you have about uh, what we do at Amazon Web Services here in Vancouver or more generally, you're welcome to come talk to us. Uh, I really want to thank the sponsors for sponsoring this event. Uh, thank you, Soft Choice, really appreciate it. And finally, uh, Codeport for hosting us. So thanks again. If anybody wants to ask me any questions right now, I'm happy to answer them. Otherwise, feel free to, to approach me or Jack Deco or Lexi tonight. Any questions? Uh, yes? What are the main advantages of Aurora? And Spark. And Spark? Yeah. Uh, so is, is your question, what are the advantages of, of Amazon Aurora over Spark? Yeah. Hmm. Unfortunately, I don't work a lot with the Spark team. I'm not in the best position to answer that for you. If you like, come and approach, approach me afterwards, and I can put you in the touch with the people that can answer your question. OK. Uh, as you told, it's memory-based Spark. Right. And uh, it's open source. Right. Uh, and easy to access. That's my question because uh, I didn't uh, read about uh, Amazon Aura. And right. I think Spark has a very different set of use cases than what we're going after for Amazon Aurora. Um, Amazon Aurora is really targeted at customers that are either using MySQL or using commercial relational databases. I believe Spark is ideally suited for a different set of use cases than that. I think it's used for analytics and stuff like that. It's more like Right. Yeah, right. And I think there were some announcements around um, Kinesis with Spark. Maybe there were some announcements with Spark anyway that came out of uh, reInvent, which I was actually thinking of touching on, but I thought that would need a session on its own. Yeah, so feel free to come and talk to me afterwards, and I, I can point you with the right people at least. Uh, any other questions? I think I throw one more hand. Yes? What's the code base you use for Aurora? What is the code base we use for Aurora? Right, I mean, you did develop it from scratch, right? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, I can't answer that. <laughs> I, I know the answer, I just can't answer okay. that. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> I wish I could. Any other questions? Anything I can't answer? <laughs> no? Oh, uh, yes, question. So, can you elaborate on talking about storing the data systems across multiple data centers? So, I know the data centers are in the same company. How do I have the entire stores? Can you just elaborate a little bit on exactly how you're distributing that data and how the performance is? Sure, sure. Okay. So there's a number of different things we did to improve performance. One of them was a lot of work on the query optimization layer in order to work with the storage layer that we're using. So with the storage layer, we're not using block storage anymore. We completely ripped out the storage layer and moved to what we call log-based storage. So when you basically do a write, what we're storing behind the scenes is block deltas. We're saying this is what this is a change that will be need, that we will need to apply to blocks in future. Then that basically gets appended to a log and sent off to six different servers behind the scenes. Now, when the read happens that needs to touch those blocks, we can apply it at that point in time, uh, but we basically do it lazily. So, and because we're doing this behind the scenes and we're actually distributing your data across hundreds of servers in 10, uh, 10 gigabyte chunks, we can do a lot of it highly parallelized. So where Aurora really, really excels is on highly parallelized workloads where you have a very large database, you're reading from many, many different uh, tables in parallel. Uh, so those are just a couple of things that make it much faster. Um, but I'd be happy to get further into the details with you about that if you want to come and talk to me afterwards. There's a, there's a lot of different things we did to make it faster. And uh, you know I, I could talk all evening about it, but I don't want to do that to everyone here. So come and talk to me afterwards. Question? Uh, I could extend that question about uh, compliance. Yes. So it's like two data centers and another continent. Uh, So, right, no good question. So, Amazon has what we call regions, 
so for example, US West 2 or Portland is a region that actually has multiple data centers behind it. So we refer to them as availability zones. Now an availability zone essentially is a physical data center. It's a physical building that's sitting somewhere. And one of the reasons why we don't have Aurora in all AWS regions is because Aurora requires at least three availability zones. And that's not available currently in every region. That's something we're working to add. Uh, but in order to give the kind of durability guarantees that we give, we need at least three availability zones because we basically want to guarantee that unless the, data, the, unless the whole area gets hit by a tidal wave, you're never going to lose your data. But I think your question relating to compliance was along the lines of how do you make sure that you're only in one physical uh, locale. So if, if, for example, you only want to store your data in one particular region, we're not going to replicate your data outside of that region unless you specifically ask us to. So I'm not 100% sure if I'm answering your question, but... Um, I think you're just extending my yep. what you might have asked. Okay. Okay. Are there any other questions? Nope. Nothing okay. official about Canada? <laughs> I can't say anything about that. I'm sorry. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Matt. I'm going to turn it back over to you. I just cough. Is that 2016? <laughs> okay. So, just wrapping up, uh, the next pug. Um, so the next pug will be on the 1st of December. So not our usual trip, uh, not our usual Wednesday, just because of uh, scheduling conflict with the venue here at Cocor, but uh, Tuesday just as good. Uh, six o'clock as usual, here, same bat channel, same bat place. Uh, the topic will be on DevOps for cloud. So uh, I, I think it's a good way to wrap up the year. Uh, I think probably a lot of us here are in that dev space. Um, we'll also be having a guest speaker here from Veeam, one of our sponsors. I will make sure that it's not a sales pitch, that it's a technical <laughs> talk. Um, so, but they have uh, something to talk to us about uh, on the DevOps and test dev uh, space. So, and then also uh, we'll be getting in, uh, I know it was a little bit of a disaster last time, but we've learned from our lessons and we're going to have the big clock in again and have a race between uh, Microsoft Azure and uh, Amazon AWS to build a workload up there. Uh, this time we are going to be, we're going to let the Microsoft and Amazon guys uh, do their research and do everything they can to be faster than each other but make sure that they have nothing pre-built beforehand. So no pre-built scripts or anything, it has to be a stock standard uh, environment. Uh, so that'll be an interesting race to see. I'm sure it'll be only a few seconds. So we might have to record it and play it back in slow motion. Um, and then we've also got a prize pack that we've put together uh, from our sponsors uh, for the best tweet in the next month about the next event. Uh, so that prize pack will include a mug, a t-shirt, a uh, Bose headphone, uh, so it's not some sort of cheap prize, uh, and a Jawbone Bluetooth speaker box. So, um, so it's not a Sonos, but it's very close. Uh, and just make sure you mention the uh, hashtag PugCloud, uh, that way we'll be able to uh, have a look at the end of the month of all the... Uh, Funny, amusing, and creative uh, tweets that you guys have been putting out there about the next event. Uh, so, uh, December will be our last event until February. Uh, every year we skip January because uh, this is obviously the first week of the year we're all going to be hungover, obviously. Uh, or in Hawaii. Could be in Hawaii? I don't know. I don't know. Is Hawaii really cold? December? I don't know. I'm, I'm used to Australia where. Christmas, so you're sweating and you're going to the beach. So, um, hopefully we have snow here this year so I can go snowboarding. Uh, so, again, reminder, we have the uh, voting on the Pug Group website for topics, so let us know what topics. We've actually added uh, big data and analytics to next year's topics due to the votes that have been cast up there already. Uh, contact us if you want to do lightning talks, if you want to volunteer, if you want to actually sponsor a event or a whole year of events. Uh, the video for this event and past events were a little bit behind on getting the videos up there, but we will get that done uh, in short order and get them up on copycloud.net. And finally, again, like, uh, let us know what you guys want to hear and see, because this is a community event. We've got the sponsors there wanting to preach to us, but we hold them back to make sure that 
we're actually delivering something of use to you guys and that's our sales pitch. So let us know what you guys want to hear. Uh, we have got a whole roadmap for next year already planned out, but that can change shaped on the feedback that we get from you guys. And just finally, they've all probably just hit us, Pete down the back there and that, uh, Terence, Brian, Bobby, uh, David, okay, they're all around, okay. <laughs> I apologize. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to thank the Soft Choice team for coming out here. It makes sure that I don't have a big uh, sweaty back by the, by the start of uh, proceedings tonight. They uh, help me run around and get all this food together on the recording gear and uh, everything like that. So uh, I want to thank them. And yeah. So th thank, you. thank you guys for coming out. So,